It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm your host, Blair Hodges, and this episode is all about Brigham Young. Brigham was a complex man. He inspired thousands of Latter-day Saints to make an arduous trek to the West after Joseph Smith was murdered, but he could also be quite a bit more coarse than most contemporary Mormons might realize. In 2012, Harvard University Press published a new biography of the Mormon prophet by John Turner. It's called Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. The book was reviewed in Volume 1 of the Mormon Studies Review, and Turner himself wrote a piece for the upcoming issue of the Mormon Studies Review, which is slated for publication at the end of the year. John Turner is an assistant professor of religious studies at George Mason University, and he joined me via Skype from Germany, where he is currently working. The Brigham biography is also scheduled to appear in an inexpensive paperback this October, so I think it's an especially opportune time to speak with Turner about the life of this remarkable 19th century pioneer, politician, and church leader. It's Brigham Young on this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. All right, I'm here with John Turner. He's the author of the biography of Brigham Young. Brigham Young Pioneer Prophet, and he's joining us from Germany today. How are you, John? I'm very good. Thank you, Blair. I'm happy to be with you. Yeah, I'm glad to get a chance to talk with you about the book. It, it came out a little while ago. It's not brand, brand new, but uh, I think I think it's a important enough book to, to want to revisit again. Um, I wanted to start by talking about sort of the nature of biography writing in general, so how historians uh, approach the past through particular people and biography. Is that a tricky genre for historians to work in? Well, I don't think it's tricky in terms of being difficult, particularly difficult for historians to do it. I think it lends itself to narrative history and storytelling. And so any historian who likes narrative history and likes to tell stories probably would enjoy writing a biography. And I think for readers, especially outside of academia, biography is a very attractive genre of nonfiction because it has a natural narrative arc, you know, beginning with usually with somebody's birth and ending with that, that person's death. I think within academia, biography is not always as highly regarded biographies, especially especially today, I, I think biography is sometimes criticized as being overly focused on great men uh, instead of on broader social trends. But I think scholars, historians can both tell a good story within a biography and use a, an individual's life, and usually the individuals that surround that individual, to illuminate larger trends about about history. So what are some of the drawbacks of, of doing biography then? Well, I think the drawback is that any single individual isn't necessarily going to be representative of the trends that one wants to illuminate. You know, individuals have their idiosyncrasies. And so I think being narrowly focused on an individual could lead a historian Astray. I mean, Brigham Young, for instance, many aspects of his personality reflect things about 19th century American culture, but you and I would probably quickly agree that he was also unusual in many ways. So one has to keep one's eyes on other ways of examining culture and history beyond the individual and find intelligent ways to connect those two. So Brigham Young is your particular subject, then. Why did you turn to him? Well, I wanted to write something about the Latter-day Saints, and I initially thought that I would write a book on Mormons and politics after the Second World War, and this was back in 2007, 2008. So that, that probably wouldn't have been a terribly bad idea either, given what happened afterwards. <laughs> and part of my reason for wanting to do that was I wanted to learn more about Mormonism. You know, I would kind of had a little bit of an interest in the subject for a while, and sometimes the best way to learn about a subject is to, you know, research it, research it for yourself. And when once I started doing some background reading on Mormon history, I was drawn very much to the 19th century story. And I recognize Brigham Young as 
a figure of obvious significance, not just for the history of the LDS Church, but also for the broader story of 19th century American history. And I didn't find the existing biographies of Brigham Young fully satisfying. I was going to ask about that. Just the you, you mentioned in the preface that the range of biographies of Brigham Young, that they range from the hagiographic to the salacious. So what are some examples of that, that uh, past biographies and some of the problems there? Well, you know, first of all, you know, historians are always a rather arrogant bunch because they always think, you know, previous books on their subject have somehow been inadequate and need to be updated. But, you know, for starters, Leonard Arrington's biography came out in, I forget if it's 85 or 86. So about a quarter century from when um, mine was going to come out. And there's been a tremendous amount of scholarship on the Latter-day Saints since um, American Moses' publication, a wealth of new sources available. So that alone would have, in my opinion, been very good reason to, to write an, uh, another biography of Brigham Young. In terms of existing biographies, you know, Stanley Hirschson's biography, Lion of the Lord, uh, which came out around 1969, I think, that I would put in the more salacious category of um, using Eastern non-Mormon newspapers to perpetuate any 19th century rumor about Brigham Young. So I, I didn't really think of that as a very credible work of scholarship. There are older biographies such as Brigham Young, the Colonizer, I think by um, Hunter, Milton Hunter, um, that are perhaps a bit more hagiographic, although also having you know good information about uh, the colonization of the Great Basin. I wouldn't call Leonard Arrington's biography hagiographic. And that's basically a, a really sort of faith-promoting or a uh, book that avoids yeah. controversial things, right? Yeah. And I, you know, I don't think Leonard Arrington, you know, I think he was comfortable with, in many of his publications, with what he called a naturalistic treatment of the past. But I did think that American Moses didn't spend enough time on some of the things that were most controversial about Young's leadership. So I thought there was quite a bit more to be done on, on quite a few topics. Though it was sad that um, Lion and the Lord and American Moses were both already taken as titles. They are wonderfully <laughs> titled books. Well, I think your title is really good, and we'll, we'll actually talk about um, about the title in just a moment, it, uh, Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. But before we do that, um, I want to dig a little bit deeper in terms of another reason why this biography came out at an opportune time, and that's just source access. Uh, Leonard Arrington obviously uh, served as church historian for a time, and so he had access to a lot of the records, uh, well, pretty much anything that he could personally find or have, uh, you know, have researchers find. Uh, and then those sources uh, for a time were made less available to historians. Mm -hmm. Talk about your source access and, and how you um, managed to, to get information on Brigham Young using the Church History Library. Sure. Well, over the span of a few years, the um, church archives made the entirety of the Brigham Young papers accessible and open to me um, and really bent over backwards to, to help in many respects and made many other collections that like you said, were perhaps previously not accessible, uh, also made those available to me. And I plunged into the project without knowing whether or not I would gain access to all of those sources. I certainly could not have written the biography the way I did and the way I think it needed to be written without being able to examine all of those sources myself. I mean, was that unusual level of access? I mean, you're you're personally not a, a Latter Day Saint, so coming to the Church History Library, did did you find it difficult to get introductions or to get access to that, or or was it a more um, more smooth process? It was pretty smooth. I think there maybe was a process of getting acquainted and um, developing a certain amount of rapport before everything that I just described was accessible. But I, I was 
coming at this without much background knowledge of what was accessible to other people. I basically just showed up and got to work and um, didn't hesitate to ask for things. And, you know, it, it, you know, it just, it worked out and it probably was, probably was an opportune time because the church is more um, open and willing to work with outside scholars than, than would have been the case in the past. Mm-hmm. Let's let's look at the book itself now and some of the things that, that you draw out throughout your narrative. You start the book off by obviously talking about his upbringing, his youth, and the surrounding culture that he lived in, things like that. I was struck by your conclusion at the end of those introductory stories um, when you said that by the time he was almost 30 years old, no one might have guessed that he'd become the leader of a large new religious group. He hadn't done anything particularly outstanding or uh, hadn't shown – any unusual promise up to that point, right? Mm-hmm. No, that's quite right. And that would be true almost any, from any angle. You know, no signs of economic success. I think he was hardworking and a very capable craftsman, but just was finding it difficult to get ahead, moved around constantly, as did many of his other family members. I think he and one of his siblings bought some property in the late 1820s and were quickly behind on the payments, which probably sounds rather reminiscent of Joseph Smith's own experience. And in terms of religion, I think he was also a drifter that way. He had joined a Methodist church, a particular branch of Methodism, and was active in that way for some time. I think had been rather active informally as an evangelist of sorts, but just had not settled down geographically, economically, religiously. And that is a stark difference after uh, his conversion to Mormonism. You mentioned Methodism, and Joseph Smith also mentioned that he had been sort of drawn to the Methodists. Was there something about their interest in Methodism that that helped – Uh, bridge them from that tradition to this new religious movement? Well, I think in Brigham Young's case, there definitely was. And he affiliated, I think, with a different branch of Methodism called Reform Methodism than um, Emma Hale and her family did. And the Reform Methodists, I think, had quite a lot of affinity with uh, the early Church of Christ. It was very much Um, a restorationist movement dedicated to restoring lost aspects of New Testament Christianity. In the case of the Reformed Methodists, they were particularly interested in the gift of healing, divine healing, and they also experimented with communal or communitarian uh, living on at least one occasion. Brigham Young was already thinking about looking for a church that reflected what he would at the time have called Bible Christianity, and was not fully convinced uh, that he had found it in Reformed Methodism, went through some periods of spiritual despondency or depression, and then when he encountered uh, Mormon elders in the early 1830s, I think in his mind he found what he had long been searching for. One of the interesting aspects, I think, of his of uh, his conversion to the LDS tradition then was his interaction with the Book of Mormon, right? This was mm-hmm. the church's sort of first missionary tool, and, and Brigham came across it uh, through his family, and mm-hmm. I really enjoyed the descriptions you made of, of his family's relationship with the Book of Mormon and, and Brigham's relationship with the Book of Mormon, because mm-hmm. they, weren't, they weren't exactly the same. No, and... You know, it's a little bit hard because in all of these cases, we're really dealing with memories of those experiences from a later point instead of they weren't keeping contemporary journals at the time. Mm -hmm. In Brigham's case, he encountered the Book of Mormon and I think was highly intrigued but uncertain and spent quite a lot of time thinking about the Book of Mormon, kind of mulling things over, and then really crossed that threshold of deciding to believe and be baptized when he saw a group of elders speak in tongues. And for him, that was a clear sign that the power of God was with this new church. And 
after witnessing that, his doubt really fell away, and he moved forward and was baptized, uh, and many other members of his family were baptized at roughly the same time. And of course, those kind of charismatic gifts uh, were prevalent in early Mormonism, right? They A lot of speaking in tongues and this sort of thing. And I think a lot of contemporary members of the LDS Church, thinking about Brigham Young, that's not something that that really would come to mind, I don't think, uh, for many church members. But but you argue that uh, it, it seems from the records uh, that that speaking in tongues, in the sense of some sort of heavenly language, maybe as mm-hmm. as as given by the Holy Spirit, played a pretty important role then in in Brigham Young's uh, conversion. Did that carry through throughout his life, or is that something that sort of uh, petered out? I think it was very important for his first ten years in the church. And it was quite central, I think, to early Latter-day Saint spirituality um, as a sign of the restoration of spiritual gifts. You could say, as the Book of Moroni uh, suggests. Uh, so no, he, he saw that as, as very significant. Joseph Smith went back and forth a bit on whether or not it was advisable for church members to seek that particular gift, um, eventually con- concluding that that perhaps it was not. Uh, you know, I think it, it carried a possibility for disruption and, and a bit of contention. For Brigham, it was very important, at least through his mission to England uh, in the early 1840s. And when he was in England as one of the apostles, well, as the president of, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles leading the mission to England, He actively sought to introduce uh, English converts uh, to that gift of speaking in tongues uh, because they so dearly wanted to experience that godly power for themselves. I think after after that, um, there's one recorded instance from the early 1850s uh, that I'm not absolutely sold on, and then it does fade away from Brigham's own personal spirituality. It's important to some members of his family beyond that, and still important to quite a few Latter-day Saints in the early Utah period. You mentioned Brigham Young becoming president of the of the Apostles, uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve, and that's that's a pretty significant position for a new convert to have. And, and in this early church, you saw people like Oliver Cowdery or Sidney Rigdon becoming early leaders. Sidney Rigdon had, had a background in preaching. He had a wonderful oratory style. Uh, Oliver Cowdery obviously helped with the translation of the Book of Mormon and was uh, well-educated comparatively. How did Brigham Young rise through the ranks um, in comparison with some of these other converts who seemed more likely to rise through the ranks? Yeah. Well, and his own own elder brother, Joseph Young, I think, was considered more likely at first as well. I think for Brigham Young, it was really two things— uh, the spiritual fire that we've all already been touching on, which manifested itself among other ways through speaking in tongues, and his very much unswerving loyalty uh, to Joseph Smith. Uh, those two things were really responsible for him rising up within the, the church's hierarchy. Uh, you know, he's, he's ordained as one of the initial members of the Twelve shortly after the Zion's Camp March, you know, there are other church members who are on that march and question Joseph's leadership. For Brigham Young, it was absolutely confirmatory of, of Joseph's leadership and God's providence over the church. And then as the 1830s proceed, quite a few other high-ranking church members question or reject uh, Joseph's leadership, and Brigham doesn't. Um, you know, maybe finds one or two things a little bit difficult along the way, but his loyalty is really ironclad, which is why then I think he emerges as someone that Joseph Smith trusts wholeheartedly uh, in the 1840s. Your narrative actually traces a little bit of development in Brigham Young's thought and his relationship to Joseph Smith in particular, and you mentioned that he he had this deep loyalty for Joseph Smith and his relationship overall over the course of their lives together for that you know, 15 or so years seems to have 
changed a little bit. So his his early view, I'm thinking of the Kirtland Bank issue right mm-hmm. here. And this is where Joseph encouraged church members to in, invest in this banking operation. Um, the bank ultimately failed, and and there were a lot of people who felt like Joseph had had uh, lost his prophetic gift or had misled them. And Brigham Young at that time. Uh, argued vigorously for Joseph Smith. He said that mm-hmm. he couldn't even entertain the possibility that Joseph Smith could be wrong in these financial matters uh, because that would cause him to lose all confidence in Joseph Smith. But then in, in a later, in a, in a different sermon, Brigham made a different point when he was talking about the Kirtland Bank. He said that that if God was working through Joseph Smith as he believed that he was, then when Joseph Smith made mistakes, it really wasn't Brigham's business. In, uh, you know that that if God let Joseph Smith go astray, then that was between him and God's, and and those seem to be sort of different uh, different yeah. views. He it, it's almost like he he couldn't entertain the possibility of Joseph Smith making mistakes, and then later he obviously could. So it seems that he must have sort of confronted um, things that he viewed as being mistakes sure. by Joseph Smith, and that that's different from Wilford Woodruff's idea. Wilford Woodruff had this idea that he was encouraged seeing Joseph Smith's mistakes because he said, you know, if God can work through Joseph uh, as an imperfect person like that, then he can work through me. So do you see yeah. Brigham's relationship changing like that? Was that was that something that came out through the course of your research? Well, I, you know, I think, first of all, all of those retrospective quotes are a little bit um, difficult to know how to interpret because Brigham Young is making those comments when he's already the leader of the church himself. So they also reflect his views of contemporary problems and his own leadership, I think. I think he was quite aware that Joseph Smith had shortcomings and made mistakes. And he was very clear later on, for instance, that Joseph's ability to lead the church on what he called a temporal basis was sometimes faulty. In particular, he criticized Joseph for not taking a harsher stand against dissent within the church. And I think I'm more inclined to give credence to the quotes that say, Joseph, yes, Joseph made mistakes and was not a perfect leader. But I think in Brigham Young's mind, Joseph was God's prophet, which didn't, didn't mean infallible earthly leadership. But you know, God's ordained, anointed prophet. And through this man, um, I found the true church. And if he slips up in some way, that's not going to question my fundamental faith in him as a prophet. So I think that's the way that that Brigham approached it. And I, I think because he had such a strong faith in the church and in Joseph, he didn't fall away when the same setbacks caused many other people to do so. That seems to me to be one of the most difficult things then for a biographer to do is to take these statements and and like you said, some of them, many of them were made later on in different contexts. And so, you know, how much reliability or accuracy can you expect, right? In a sermon where he says, I didn't think Joseph could I didn't question Joseph. It, he could really be saying, you shouldn't question me because now right. I'm in Joseph's shoes. And as a biographer, that seems like a pretty tricky uh, negotiation to make, right? Because you're feeling in gaps. There, right. there are multiple plausible readings there. And how do, you, how do you adjudicate between those? You could say he was just tell, yeah. stating the facts or you could say yeah. he was making this pragmatic point for that particular moment, you know. I mean, I think through our memories, we, you know, we're always reinterpreting the past. And, but, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or. I mean, when he's saying um, Joseph made mistakes and um, I still trusted him as a prophet, well, Joseph did make mistakes and he did still trust him as a prophet. And he could also be um, making statements about uh, his own leadership. And I, for instance, when I think he's saying Joseph was not strict or harsh enough against dissent, he was sending a very clear warning that he wasn't going to tolerate any. And, you know, but both of those could be true at the same time. I think that's one one of, there are several main theses that you sort of explore throughout the book. I think that's one of them is this idea that Joseph, or that Brigham Young 
took lessons from having watched Joseph Smith and what Joseph went through. And the idea was that, that Joseph kept giving people chances, kept giving them chances, chances. And, and, and although he himself was imperfect, he would give chances to, also, to other imperfect people who some of them ended up betraying Joseph Smith. And, and that, that Brigham just did not want to see something like that happen. Do you think that, that the, the murder of Joseph Smith – was kind of a deep part of Brigham's psyche as a leader going forward in that way? Oh, very much. I mean, I see that as the pivot of the, of the book, of the biography, and also at, subsequent to his conversion, one of the key pivots in Brigham Young's life. And he watches what happens in Nauvoo and is personally traumatized by Joseph's murder and then further traumatized by the political situation going forward until they leave Illinois, very much lives in fear of his own assassination, not just while they are still in Nauvoo, but into the 1870s, really right right until the end of his life. So I think on, on a very human level, he did not want the events of Nauvoo to repeat themselves, both in terms of threats to his own safety and um, in terms of uh, threats to the church's future viability and and survival. So I think he was absolutely determined not to allow what happened in Nauvoo to repeat itself. The only thing I would say is that I, I think there is a bit of a softening of that attitude um, over the last 10 years or so of his life where he does feel more certainly much more secure about the church's survival and a bit less hyper vigilant about about his own. What are some of the specific things, some specific actions that that Brigham Young took um, as he was negotiating his role as leader uh, that you saw as being different from Joseph Smith's leadership style? And this gets to some of the more difficult aspects of of the book, or some of the less flattering elements of Brigham Young as a person. I mean, I guess one thing I'd say before getting into what you call the less flattering aspects is one of the very intelligent things he does is he decides not to imitate Joseph Smith. So I think from a very early stage, uh, he thinks of himself as a prophet and as a revelator, but he doesn't try to lead the church in the same way that Joseph had led it, especially the way Joseph had led it um, in the late 1820s and early 1830s. You know, Brigham knows that many Latter-day Saints are hungering for a written revelation of some sort, you know, affirming God's continued providence over the church after Joseph's death. And he doesn't write, and I believe he actually writes writes in his own hand in early 1847, he doesn't write a revelation until the word, word and will of the Lord as they're preparing to leave winter quarters. And that's the um, one that's been canonized, right? In that's the, the one that's in the been canon. That's the one that's been canonized. But he didn't, he didn't feel the need to, to imitate Joseph, and he very bluntly uh, told the people, you know, you might not have written revelations, but you should regard my words as scripture. You know, the living oracles are of paramount uh, importance. And that's a key shift in leadership. And there are other claimants to Joseph's prophetic mantle who do try to imitate him. And I think that was very wise on Brigham's part not not to do so. And then in terms of um, the less flattering aspects I guess that returns to the to the question of of managing dissent. I mean, he didn't hesitate to um, publicly rebuke and humiliate people that he felt challenged his leadership. So Orson Pratt, I think sometimes he he treated pretty shabbily in terms of how he talk about him in public uh, for many years, and it took it took Brigham quite a long time to move on from those sorts of clashes. Um, He's very unkind to Thomas Marsh. Um, 
his earlier superior within the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who leaves the church and betrays Joseph in 1838, when Marsh comes to Utah, um, you know, Brigham publicly humiliates him in front of a congregation. So, you know, he, he has those moments where he really puts people in their place. And, you know, is not afraid to threaten people with very dire consequences. So let's explore this a little bit more then. And this is um, another key theme of your book is sort of the religious aspect, uh, the, what, what we would consider to be more spiritual or religious aspects of, of Brigham Young. Because the assumption that a lot of people have is that Joseph was this charismatic prophetic figure who had these revelations and led the church. And that then Brigham Young took over and he was this pragmatic, um, hard-minded man who led the saints across the plains and helped establish all of these colonies and got uh, the church involved in business pursuits and things sort of as though that was those were things Joseph Smith you know wasn't interested in uh, and and you kind of turn that stereotype a little bit on its head or at least give a different view of it and that's one of the most fascinating parts of the book this is that Brigham was more than a colonizing pioneer but that he was also a religious pioneer and this is why you're subtitle is Pioneer Prophet, because he had a prophetic role uh, to play. So can you talk about that element of Brigham Young as a leader and how he fulfilled what you you call a a priestly role for Mormons? Sure. Well, no, I I agree with the premise of your question that too often people draw that strict um, dichotomy between Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, with one being you know, one being the charismatic prophet and the other one being maybe the bureaucratic organizer, which would mm-hmm. maybe put it more strongly than, than most people would put. But I think there is that, that basic sense. So I, I very much wanted to present Brigham Young as, as a sp- spiritual figure, as a religious leader, as a theological speculator, as um, a priestly leader. And certainly one sees that right from the get-go in Nauvoo um, with the completion of the Nauvoo Temple and with Brigham leading the people uh, through the ordinances uh, in Nauvoo. And, you know, at the very end of his life, you have Brigham Young dedicating the Nauvoo Temple and carefully going over the performance of ordinances. And he, you know, he talks about a future of hundreds of temples, and it got in the construction started on four by the time of his death. So that's that's very significant uh, in terms of his religious thought and leadership. He was always very interested in theological questions, even before Joseph's death. You know, he, he traveled with a Bible dictionary in a concordance, or at least asked one time for those, you know, items to be sent to him, or, or something along those lines. When the apostles would meet in the early 1850s regularly uh, in Salt Lake City, they would discuss all sorts of theological topics. Some of those didn't really pan out, right? I mean, you talk about, for example, the Adam God uh, Mm -hmm. teachings. What what did you make of that? Because that's something that still puzzles members of the LDS Church in terms of what Brigham Young was trying to do with that. Well, what I... I mean, the way I understand his identification of Adam as humanity's God is, you know, he's thinking about the way that Joseph Smith has introduced a hierarchy of divine beings. And in Brigham's mind, um, Adam as humanity's God makes logical sense. Not necessarily that Adam is the head God Um, or the head of the council of gods, but that he is an exalted being who's come to this earth um, to people it, and that therefore he is the god that human beings, um, the only one they they have to interact with. So he's, you know, he he is their father and god. Um, And I think that, that that was important in Brigham Young's thinking. He when he introduces it in the 1850s, it, it meets with some resistance, uh, not only from Orson Pratt, but you, you know, some, some Latter-day Saints find it very appealing, others do not. And I think it causes enough confusion that Brigham basically shelves it 
for a while and says, you know, that it's really not the most important thing, um, whether um, Adam or his father or his grandfather is is Elohim or God the Father. And so he, you know, he says that's that's not that's not crucial. But then he does reintroduce the idea in the 1870s. So it was important to him. It stuck and with him, right? He thought enough to bring it back. It stuck with him, and ultimately, future generations of church leaders didn't find it um, the most convincing interpretation of Joseph Smith's later teachings, and you know, essentially rejected as ultimately not doctrinal. It's a really interesting process you describe, because here you have the leader of the church at the time making these types of doctrinal pronouncements, and you have other, uh, you have apostles that are publicly sort of speaking against those uh, teachings, and then you have Brigham and Orson Pratt, you mentioned in particular, and then you have Brigham sort of going uh, and criticizing Orson publicly, and you have these sorts of of arguments, and then you had regular Latter-day Saints who were looking on, some of them just seemed downright puzzled, some of them seemed happy to embrace these things, whether they really got what Brigham was saying. It's really an interesting dynamic. You'd think as a president of the church that Brigham Young's word would just be accepted, right? But it wasn't, though, according to you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think he, it wasn't the only thing that um, he and Orson Pratt butted heads over. It was, it was one, of, one of several issues. Uh, I don't even know if I'd say it was the most important. But, you know, Br- Brigham was okay with knowing that not everybody was convinced by his teachings about Adam, he would not tolerate public opposition. But, you know, he, he didn't want to turn Mormonism into a creedal religion by any means. And so for him, what was important was loyalty, obedience, you know, righteous living, not belief. Um, you know, in, in a general sense, I would say that belief is is more important or even more highly valued in Latter-day Saint religious culture today than it was back in the mid-19th century. Hmm. I'm speaking with John Turner. He's the author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. One of the things that you mentioned early in the interview is that your book, biographies in general, can use historical figures to illuminate wider historical issues. And early on in the book, you actually list you have a list of uh, of issues that, that the book's going to touch on through Brigham Young, uh, westward expansion, popular sovereignty, religious freedom, vigilantism, and reconstruction. And I wanted to take a few minutes to talk briefly about each of these issues and how Brigham Young's life sheds light on them. So we'll start with the most obvious one is probably westward expansion. So how did uh, Brigham's actions as the as the leader of this church speak to the issue of westward expansion in the 19th century United States? I mean, maybe that's the simplest one. Um, you know, obviously the Latter-day Saints were a very significant part of, of westward expansion. And I think probably most of your listeners know, know a fair bit about that story. I mean, I when I first learned about that aspect of Brigham Young's life and that section of church history, I didn't know just how extensive that line of early Mormon Utah settlements, well, not just Utah, early Mormon settlements was, you know, stretching from San Bernardino all the way into southern Idaho. Um, And the sheer number of people that were crossing, often all the way from England um, to Utah each year for uh, several decades. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's, and there's a lot of other things wrapped up in that issue. Conflict with Native Americans in Utah, um, tension with the U.S. government as the U.S. government slowly um, seeks to exercise sovereignty over the territory that it has claimed after the war against Mexico. So westward expansion means a lot more than simply settlement of a particular region. It, you know, brought forth a whole host of issues that other Americans, um, other white Americans uh, going west also encountered. And sometimes Latter-day Saint history reflects uh, commonality with those other experiences. Sometimes there's some divergences from it. 
I think the example of Native Americans is, is, a, is a good one to think about. How did um, Brigham Young's approach to Native Americans compare with wider American approaches? Uh, and, and the reason I ask is because um, it wasn't the case that when the Latter-day Saints came to what now is called Utah, that it was just this wide open, empty space. There, there were Native Americans here that, that were, for the most part, eventually displaced um, because yeah. of the uh, immigration my understanding is that you know the initial settlement in the Salt Lake Valley was in a buffer zone of sorts between uh, different native groups, and so that was probably fortuitous. But very quickly, there's there's um, substantial tension, uh, namely when Latter Day Saints begin moving into Utah Valley and moving into very fertile fishing grounds that uh, Utes are are using, and so from the start, there's there's all sorts of tension and conflicts between settlers and Indians, and you know Brigham Young initially encourages his people, you know, don't don't get too bent out of shape over a stolen shirt. You know, you you wouldn't shoot a white man who stole a shirt from you. So why should you you know kill an Indian as retribution? But very quickly, he he authorizes a a very punitive and harsh military response. Uh, in Utah Valley that's very bloody um, and pretty grim. Was and, he trying to set a tone with that or something? Because that's, that's the puzzle, right? As you have Brigham Young on record talking about um, treating the Indians kindly, there's a paternalism to his, to his discussion of Native Americans. But then you also have these incidents where he's authorized mil- militant action. Yeah, and I mean that's probably the – you know, that's probably the harshest instance of his own leadership against Indians during the, you know, during his time in Utah. So, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's hard to know. I think he feels that the conflict's unavoidable. Um, the settlers in Utah Valley are very much pushing for a response. I think they're also kind of subtly uh, suggesting that his response up to that point has been too weak. And uh, I think he feels that when he responds, he's going to respond um, for maximum effect. And, you know, there's some American officials actually on the scene that are also supportive uh, at the time. You know, I think, I think his Indian policy does become relatively more benevolent and humane once Latter-day Saint supremacy over Utah is more or less assured. You know, there's a there's a significant war in the mid 1860s which does question that supremacy, and you know there's a whole spectrum of preferred policies toward Indians on the part of white Westerners. You know during that time after the Civil War, you know from exterminationists to assimilationists um, to to other positions and. You know, Brigham Young is certainly not an ex- an exterminationist. There's actually a rather um, poignant sermon that he gives during that mid 1860s war, which is called the Black Hawk War, in which he reminds his people that even though he feels that God has given this land to the Latter Day Saints, they should be mindful of the fact that it was the Indians' land first, and that it's also their homeland. So with Brigham Young, you get you get both of those sorts of responses. Um, I think perhaps ultimately he didn't he didn't know exactly how to proceed all of the time. Um, I think this also connects to the the another one of the themes that you talk about is vigilantism, right? So, and that's mm-hmm. something that that encompasses more than just any aggressive acts against Native Americans, but it speaks to the nature of justice uh, among citizens, m- among American citizens too, right? And how mm-hmm. how did Brigham Young's experiences speak to that wider national issue? Sure, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think, you know, he he's well aware of vigilante movements, say, in California during the 1850s. Um, and so, you know, I think he can sometimes perceive the utility of, of extra-legal popular justice. You know, right, right from the start in Utah, um, he makes statements which encourage... Um, vigilante retribution against criminals, first of all. You know, there's some petty criminals that, you know, he 
very um, in very colorful and harsh terms um, encourages um, extra legal action against in in the late 1840s, and and that's that's a relatively common pattern for Brigham Young. Actually, sorting out the details of many of these cases was one of the more vexing uh, parts of researching the book. There are quite a few instances in which, you know, even into the 1860s, you know, a Gentile is killed in Salt Lake City. And Brigham Young publicly afterwards essentially condones the death and says, you know, that, you know, I can, I can understand if somebody was moving in on my land or moving in on my family. You know, I you know wouldn't wouldn't hesitate basically um, determining whether or not he has approved or authorized those actions um, is more difficult. Yeah, that's that's definitely one of the more difficult, um, or I, I should I used the the term less flattering earlier uh, elements of Brigham Young was those instances when uh, even where the historical record can't demonstrate that Brigham Young ordered particular acts of violence or orchestrated these things. At the, at the very least, there were instances uh, in the aftermath that he definitely, you know, looked on either approvingly or, or you know, with tacit approvement or, or, or more or overt. And you also deal with the fallout of the, the Mountain Meadows Massacre in a similar mm-hmm. way. And, and you, you argue that although, according to your research, Brigham Young didn't, didn't order the massacre in any, in any mm-hmm. sense, but that he helped contribute to a climate where the massacre uh, was possible to begin with, and then afterwards mm-hmm. uh, acted to protect the church's interests, even if that meant um, not assisting with the investigation as much as he might otherwise have, or or that sort of thing. Was that was that a difficult part of the book to do because it's it's a pretty loaded historical situation? Yes, no, it is. It was a hard part of the book to do, partly because at this point there's also a very voluminous uh, source record about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, but not always the all of the sources one would want. Um, so, yeah, like, like as you said, I, I don't think there is evidence that exists that, at least not that we have access to, that, that suggests or demonstrates that Brigham Young ordered the massacre. I think his response to the approaching U.S. Army in 1857 and his response to the massacre afterwards have to be viewed through what we were talking about earlier in terms of his own personal fears uh, for his own survival and for the survival of the church. I think when he gets word that an army is coming to Utah, for him it it really is an ominous sign. and you know, possibility of, of renewed mobbing and, and persecution. Even, even so, I don't think his actions that helped precipitate the sending of that army or his response to them were prudent. Uh, you know, his treatment of U.S. appointees in the 1850s was, was often pretty shabby. Um, and there's a reason that many of them complained to uh, the White House and to Congress does this get at that the, the wider historical issue of popular sovereignty? Another one of the uh, of the things you say that the book can shed light on. Well, I think so. I mean, I think Brigham certainly believed, as did quite a few other Westerners, in the principle of self-rule, and the territorial system only granted very limited self-rule, and he wasn't the only Westerner who chafed under that system. But, you know, his reaction to that is very much shaped uh, through his experiences of persecution in the East. And on the side of the U.S. government, um, the U.S. government's response is unlike that toward other territories because of concerns about theocracy uh, in Utah. So it's a very explosive and, and toxic situation from the start, you know. You know, Utah becomes a territory through the Compromise of 1850, and you know, within weeks of the first um, non-Mormon officials reaching the territory in the summer of 1851, there's you know very bitter conflict, and they're all headed back to Washington to complain about it. Um, and you know, direct conflict is, is sort of delayed for half a decade, but. Um, 
you know, the, the writing's almost on the wall very, very quickly. Another issue I think that the book speaks to is the issue of women and the place of women's roles in the 19th century and how that played out uh, in the LDS church and in Brigham Young's life. Obviously, he was a polygamist who, who married a, a lot of women, and um, polygamy is a big issue. Uh, how did you decide to approach it? It seems like there was a section that, that talked about domestic matters, but um, you sort of spent just one area on that rather than breaking up the different wives in according to the chronology of the book or something. Was, was that yeah. a difficult thing to, to grapple with given the, the, the number of wives? Yes. No, it's much easier to write biographies of people with only one spouse. Yeah, right. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I touched on his marriages in, in a number of different chapters. It was a little bit hard to know how to integrate that into the broader narrative. So you, in some ways you have to go back and forth between his political leadership, his um, more overtly spiritual or theological leadership, and, and then his personal life. I found it fascinating to to research the marriages and the experiences of his wives, quite a few of whom were rather obscure. And in many instances, I was able to use uh, sources that others had at least not made use of before and rescue some some of those lives from obs- obscurity. I couldn't by any means fully relate them in the course of the Brigham Young biography. Many of them would make for great studies in their own right. But, you know, the, and, and the marriages were fascinating because there, there wasn't necessarily a pattern uh, to them. You know, he married all sorts of different women in terms of age, in terms of temperament. And I think he and the women entered those marriages for many different sorts of reasons. So, you know, I, I resisted, you know, you know, generalizing too much. And I, I, I tried to incorporate as many of the fascinating stories uh, as I could. One of the interesting points you make is that you could you could sort of mine through Brigham Young's statements about women over the thirty or so years of recorded sermons that he gave, and and you'd find statements so various that that you could either make him out to be a misogynist or you could make him out to be a proto-feminist, right? So, mm-hmm. what sort of different things were you referring to there in terms of his attitudes and statements regarding the place of women? Well, he had some, you know, even in the eighteen forties, he had some rather crude statements about. You know why one should not um, listen to listen to women, especially in terms of ecclesiastical uh, leadership. Since this is a family program, I won't fully quote <laughs> from all of those, Blair. Um, and my conclusion in in the book is that you know by the end of his life he was more open to women's leadership. I think he was very suspicious of Relief Society shortly after Joseph Smith's death and makes a point of not restarting the Relief Society, but then allows uh, its resurrection um, in the 1860s and promotes and encourages the leadership of women such as Zina Huntington and Eliza Snow. And I think finds himself respecting uh, their ecclesiastical and intellectual gifts. I mean, I think that was definitely the case in the instance of Eliza Snow. A more cynical view could say that that Brigham Young saw a need to uh, control women more and and decided to enlist them to help him do that. A less cynical uh, view would see him as recognizing contributions that women could make and, and, uh, you know, inviting them to do that. Yeah, no, I I think that's true. And, you know, there's, you're quite right that since Brigham Young said so many different things over the course of his life, it's one should be really wary of drawing too much of a conclusion from any single quote. There's also an interesting early quote where he talks about his conception of a spiritual wife as someone who can pray and anoint the sick with oil, I believe. It's been a while since mm-hmm. I looked at the quote. But, you know, I think, you know, also the way that... Um, temple work is structured there's there's a clear and necessary role for women in in that aspect of church work as well that i actually thought that you handled the the issue of temple ordinances quite deftly that's that's a very difficult topic for historians to approach especially given the contemporary lds church's reverence for temple rights and 
And was that a difficult uh, part of the book for you? How did you navigate uh, around what would be appropriate for you to talk about in terms of the temple? You know, I think that is, I think that is a tricky issue for authors. Um, tricky for a number of reasons. And partly, you know, Latter-day Saints themselves have somewhat different opinions about what exactly is within bounds and what's not within bounds in terms of the extent to which one should discuss uh, sacred ordinances. Tricky, on the other hand, because that's a very important part of Brigham Young's um, religious leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think it was something that should be ignored. And just simply in terms of understanding the development of, of Mormon practice and belief, that's it's very important. So I tried, you know, I tried hard to discuss temples and ordinances clearly and and respectfully. So you, I'm glad you thought it was a reasonable balance. I, I mean, what, I'm sure, I'm sure some, I'm sure it will bother some, right? I mean, there, obviously, there are Mormons like Hugh Nibley who said a great deal, and there are other. Uh, Mormons who would feel uncomfortable even mentioning something as basic as that, uh, that it tells a story of Adam and Eve, right? And right. Did, you, did you talk to practicing Mormons to, to gauge sort of where the sensitivities are, or how did you navigate that specifically? No, I did. I did, and, you know, I, I, well, I mean, I had quite a few people read the whole manuscript to begin with, and um, I asked a number of other people specifically to look at those sections and let me know what they thought. And um, you know, I, I, like like you said, I, I, you know, there was there was actually something of a range of opinions where, you know, I would say the majority of the people I asked to read it said, you know, this is respectful and you know nicely done. And you know, I think there were a couple of people who have said, you know, those sections make both me and probably others a little bit uncomfortable. In the last part of the interview, we'll, we'll come back to it because I think it's it speaks to a really important issue. Let's take a break really quick. Uh, we're talking with John Turner. He's the author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. We'll take a break and be right back. Hey, this is Blair Hodges. First, I want to thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm interrupting my own interview to invite you to help me out. I'm not asking for a lot. I'm just asking you to take a moment to rate this show in the iTunes store or share a link to the episode on your Facebook wall. Tweet it. Burn a CD for your folks and send up smoke signals. Let people know that you listen to the show and help us grow our audience. If you rate the Maxwell Institute podcast in the iTunes store, that's the simplest way you can help us. But I also hope that you enjoy these interviews enough to let a few of your friends know about us, too. Thanks again for listening. We're speaking with John Turner. He's the author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. John, for the last part of this interview, I, I sort of wanted to talk about one of the criticisms, one of the common criticisms I've seen of the book. And that, that regards the question, why would anybody want to follow the Brigham Young depicted in this book. Why was this Brigham Young revered uh, or looked to as a prophet? I mean, by your account, he did some un unprophetic things. Uh, there are issues of, of rhetoric or issues of, of decision making or um, his views on, on blacks, uh, his, his, some of the remarks he made about women. And you you talk about those difficult issues, but then you also talk about his religious innovations. You depict him as the chief priest of, of, of Mormonism, and this speaks to the temple issue that we talked about earlier. So this is a, a common criticism, and, I, and I'm interested in your uh, response to that uh, because it's something that, that has been mentioned on, uh, in multiple reviews. Well, reviews aren't perfect, and <laughs> nice. uh, ni neither are uh, prophets and authors. So, um, no, I, I, I mean, I honestly thought that in the book I explained pretty clearly why 19th century Latter-day Saints followed Brigham Young. I'm not, not everybody did, but of those who followed him, I think the two things that most um, cemented and affirmed his leadership were the completion of the Nauvoo Temple and the successful pioneer trek and early settlement of um, the Salt Lake Valley. I mean, those were incredible, incredibly significant accomplishments in very different ways that both affirmed his 
um, priestly and his practical leadership. And I think those sorts of accomplishments built a very deep reservoir of support. So when the Latter-day Saints faced major setbacks, such as uh, during the Utah War, it was possible for people to move forward, perhaps along the lines that Brigham Young could move forward after setbacks in Ohio or Missouri. So I, I think things like that explain why people followed Brigham Young. I mean, also, um, it was very significant that he had led uh, the mission to England in the 1840s. A lot of the early um, emigrants to Nauvoo and then to Utah were people who had known Brigham Young for many years. It mm-hmm. maybe led them, helped lead them into the church. Not mm-hmm. that he was the only um, significant figure during the mission. So he, I think he had a very deep reservoir of support. And I think some of those issues that you raised didn't trouble 19th century Mormons the way they would trouble 21st century Mormons. Mm. Um, and so, yes, I mean, there would, you know, Latter-day Saints today would, would never expect President Thomas Monson to talk or act the way that Brigham Young did. But, you know, that's part of the foreignness of the past. And mm-hmm. I actually think it's a very healthy thing for not just Latter-day Saints, but for human beings to get a sense of just how incredibly foreign the past is. You know, people people are strange. Compa- you know, they seem strange. They seem different. You know, they don't necessarily have the same values and sensibilities that we do. And that's one of the foremost lessons of studying history. And I think it's very it's very beneficial in, in many ways to always be reminded of that and not expect people in the past to act the way that we do. Now, even putting those sensibilities aside, I think there are aspects of Brigham Young's leadership that are, you know, deeply troubling. Um, but I don't think it's hard. I don't think it should be difficult to understand why 19th century Latter-day Saints followed him. I think this actually gets at one of the one of the core considerations when it comes to reading a book about a religious subject like this, um, that practicing Mormons experience feelings that non-Mormons experience as they read this, you tried to strike a balance, you said, uh, to avoid parochialism and polemicism. So how would you respond then to, to a, say, a Latter-day Saint reader who says, well, I, I didn't really like this book because he makes Brigham Young look mean. He shows Brigham Young swearing or making decisions that, that look really uh, – that look bad. Uh, and I don't need to know those types of things about someone who I revere. Uh, conversely, what would you say to someone who said, whoa, John Turner, you, you took Brigham Young way too seriously here. This, it's a simple mm-hmm. story of a, of a tyrant who was interested in political control and, and the, the accumulation of wives. So those are, you know, how, how do you respond to those types of, uh, of readers? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, you can't you can't control how readers are going to respond to material. I mean, people are going to going to respond differently. I'm, I'm, you know, I I don't think I approached the project with any axe to grind, um, and so I, you know, I think, you know, I think I presented Brigham Young fairly as and certainly as best as I understood him, and. Um, yeah, I honestly, I, I don't know, I don't know too much else to to say to that, uh, Blair. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've read a range of ways people have responded to the book. Um, you know, I think people who are disappointed with the uh, with my portrait of Brigham Young, well, they certainly have every opportunity or um, privilege of examining the evidence for themselves, and it's hardly going to be the last book about Brigham Young. Maybe there'll be one they like better in a few years. Okay, <laughs> so stay tuned. You know, I, I would say in a larger sense that, you know, we should, whenever we're reading about a historical topic, whether, you know, when, when, hist- when as a historian, when you're researching something, and I think also when you're a reader encountering material, we always have to be willing to, to revise um, our understandings and our preconceptions. And that doesn't mean that if 
you're a Latter-day Saint and you believe that Brigham Young is a prophet, that you have to stop believing that Brigham Young is a prophet because of something he said or did, but it might be necessary to have some revision of, of what that means. Mm. Um, and conversely, for, um, like you said, if people think that Brigham Young is only a power-hungry, lustful tyrant, you know, I think the historical record's a lot more complex as well. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having to revise some of our conclusions. One last thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, you talk about Brigham Young's return trip to Salt Lake City that he took near the very end of his life. He he, he took a trip uh, to St. George, uh, did some temple business, and then came back. From what I understand, Brigham made some of the most far-reaching ecclesiastical changes to the church on that home trip, reorganizing wards and stakes and so forth. Um, to, that to me seem one of the most far-reaching consequences of his ecclesiastical leadership, and and you touch on it in in only about a paragraph. Did you? I'm I'm basing my understanding of that trip on my recollection of Leonard Arrington's biography. So, did you look at that and and just not find much to say there, or is that just something that uh, that you decided not to not to pause too long on for for the sake of space? Well, the latter, and I think. Um... It's, uh, I mean, I would just also say it wasn't a topic that um, grabbed me as much of some of the other storylines in the book. You're quite right about that. Um, and in general, I mean, Brigham Young is a very active leader in many ways, right, right up until his death. And it is something I could have spent more time on. I would have liked to have also spent more time on his relationship with his children. Mm. Um, I mean, and, and Leonard Arrington's work on Brigham Young's economic leadership, I would have liked to have had more time to fully explore his business leadership, his finances. Mm. Um, so, that, I mean, there were, were some decisions I had to make, and I didn't want to write a longer book than I wrote. Um, you know, it, it's, it's already something to ask people to read I don't know what it is, 375 pages, 400 pages, something, something like that. So I didn't, I didn't really want to go longer than that. So you're yeah. quite right. That, that is something I, you know, I could have explored and, and didn't. So finally, having completed the book, were you left with any unresolved questions that, that still haunted you for a while or, or that, uh, that you still thought about after the book was completed? Well, I still find, you know, I still find Brigham Young fascinating. You know, sometimes... You know, I'll have somebody send me an email with, you know, Brigham Young quote or reference, and I think, oh, I should have, <laughs> I should have included that, um, you know, because the the sources are so voluminous. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I do think to to some extent, Mountain Meadows remains a somewhat vexing topic. I, you know, I, there are great books on on the subject and and have been for some time, but it is still. It, it is still kind of a, a vexing and, and troublesome um, topic. So, yeah, uh, but I, I wouldn't say there's anything that, that keeps me up at night. Um, I still find Brigham fascinating. I still find the Latter-day Saint history and theology fascinating. I've been spending more time on the latter recently. Yeah, is there any specific projects you're doing now that touch on the Latter-day Saints? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a project on Mormons and Jesus Christ, actually. You know, I, I think actually that, you know, that, that was one thing that, that I wanted to pursue. I mean, I think Brigham wasn't especially creedal, like I said earlier, but, you know, Joseph Smith and then Brigham Young and then subsequent leaders, you know, as, as you know, they, you know, they bring forth teachings, doctrines and practices that substantially diverge from what some people call mainstream Christianity. And I wanted to spend a bit more time reflecting on that. Hmm. But that, that's a little bit, that's a ways off. Maybe we can touch base on that in a couple of years. Hmm. Okay. Um, John Turner, he's the author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to us today. Thanks, Blair. Thanks for being interested in the book, and that was fun. All right. Oh.